I'd like to start by reading uh, Daniel 7, verses 1 through 8. So you want to open up to Daniel chapter 7. There's several things in here that we need to note as we get to the, uh, the beast visions. So, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. <clears throat> Daniel spake and said, I saw her in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that, of course, we know that there is a strong relationship between Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2. I mean, we understand that these beasts represent the metal kingdoms of Daniel chapter 2. There's a, there's a remarkable difference um, between the two chapters because Daniel chapter 2, of course, the vision was given to Nebuchadnezzar. But here in Daniel chapter 7, the vision is given to Daniel. All right, so there's, a, there's a, an emphasis, a, a, a different emphasis. The first was given to Nebuchadnezzar that, so that he might know um, or begin to understand, right, that the kingdom of men belonged to Yahweh and he gives it to whomsoever he will and there would be a passing of the kingdoms from Babylon to the Persians, to the Greeks, and to the Romans, uh, much of which he didn't understand. And we also noted that uh, the next chapter where Nebuchadnezzar builds an, a, a full image of gold is his answer to Yahweh um, that his kingdom was not going to pass but that it would stand forever. Um, and so the difference being that was given to a man of limited understanding and the simplicity of it is such that we are able to use Daniel chapter 2 in expressing the passing of the kingdoms to those who are unfamiliar with Bible prophecy. We use it a lot in our, in our Bible seminars. It's very, very simple. Okay, and the, the details are such that... Um, there's no mistaking the passing of the of the power and authority of the kingdom of men. Again, keeping in mind that it is one kingdom from head to toe uh, and that it was passed from one empire or one people to another. And that's, that's very easy to see. And Daniel chapter 7 is a little bit different. We are, we are given the same passing of kingdoms, but they are being referred to as beasts. And they are given, and this vision is given to a prophet of God in a manner that is uh, suggestive of this is God's view of the passings of the kingdoms. Okay, that man that without understanding is like the beasts that perish. And so when God looks upon mankind and looks at the nations and the languages and the peoples, he sees beasts. And so he uses this to describe to those who are of, of who are enlightened, <clears throat> the, the things which were to pass uh, beginning in Daniel's day at, or in Nebuchadnezzar's day and running right through the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. So the vision of the beasts uh, is not something that is 
fully complete. Okay? There, are, there are portions of this prophecy which have yet to come to pass. That fourth beast is not yet destroyed, even though the Roman Empire, which is its primary application, uh, is gone, the beast lives on. The beast will be destroyed by the Son of Man, um, the one who was given dominion <coughs> later in the chapter. <clears throat> okay, so the lion phase. Um, we talked about this last time. Um, both Assyria and Babylon are represented in the lion phase. There we go. Um, two two uh, stages of the one part of the image in Daniel chapter 2 and the, the beast in Daniel chapter uh, 7. Because the beast begins with wings. The wings are then plucked off and then it is made to stand upon its feet and given the heart of a man. And this is descriptive of the change from the Assyrian Empire to the Babylonian Empire. Um, the uh, the wings, and as you can see there. Oh, I have um, I have a, I have some quotes concerning those pictures. Uh, the the uh, in regard to the plucking of the wings in verse four, uh, the wings were plucked first, and then the then the lion was made to stand upon its hind feet like a man, and then a man's heart was given unto it. So it was progressive, um, and the plucking of the wings. Uh, demonstrates a change from the, the the basic Assyrian mentality of conquest to the Babylonian mentality of conquest. Uh, as we mentioned last time, the Assyrian was all about conquering nations, peoples, and languages, and essentially, uh, in the name of their war god, uh, crushing all defeat, uh, and very merciless, uh, but but still mobile in taking its its empire or I should say expanding its empire. Thus it has wings, because as we know, wings are, are uh, in, indicative of movement, uh, you know, symbolically speaking. So the Assyrian there, um, in regards to the statue, the statue is a reproduction of one of a pair of guardian figures set up at the palace of oh, Ashurnasirapal II at the Assyrian capital of Nimrud. Now, of course, Nimrud sounds very close to Nimrod, doesn't it? We're, we're familiar with that, that both the Assyrian and the Babylonian stages of this kingdom of men uh, have their shared roots in Nimrod because we understand from the Genesis record that it was Nimrod who bu built both Babylon, uh, the, which was the capital of the Babylonian Empire, and Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. These, these figures were known to the Assyrians as Imasu. They combined the body of a lion, the swiftness of birds, indicated by the wings, and the intelligence of the human head. That's what was, they were conveying in that, in that statue there. So again, the wings are indicative of movement. Uh, the Babylonian lion, now we notice he doesn't have any wings, right? Okay. Uh, and the quote on this, on this particular it's not a statue, it's more of a relief. Uh, the Ishtar Gate is named so because it was dedicated to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. Although Nebuchadnezzar pays homage to other Babylonian deities through various animal representations. The animals represented on the gate are young bulls, lions, and dragons. These animals are symbolic representations of certain deities. Lions are often associated with Ishtar, Bulls with Adad and dragons with Marduk. Now, we may have heard of Marduk, but I don't think we've ever heard of, I don't know how many of us have heard of Adad, but we certainly have heard of Ishtar. Okay, Ishtar is that perpetual goddess through so many uh, different cultures, the goddess of fertility and, you know, Easter, right? Bunnies and eggs, that's what it's, that's what it's all about. Um, so this is one of their chief deities, and the lion is representative of that, but we notice that the lion does not have wings. So it's fitting, according to uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, the wings were removed. The Babylonian was not so concerned with conquest, um, military conquest. In fact, uh, they, they did very little. 
We do know that, however, that they took Judah um, because God had denied the Assyrian Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah. But later on, of course, uh, he used Babylon uh, to take his people into captivity. So, you know, notably that really the only expansion that we see in the Babylonian Empire was the taking of Judah and Jerusalem, which again, this this uh, lack of desire of expanding their, their kingdom greatly is was represented by the plucking of the wings. Um, again, the Assyrians were very mobile in their aggression against other nations. Um, Babylon was, was more concerned with um, consolidating what it had and um, converting their captives to become Babylonians, right? I think we talked about that last time in, in uh, the, the first chapter where we see Daniel and the, uh, the other young rulers are being um, groomed, if you will, by Nebuchadnezzar um, in the ways of Babylon so that they would, by his, his, his hope and estimation, that they would lead the, uh, the rest of the people uh, along those lines of, of converting to, to Babylon. And we, and we also know that Babylon had a lot of uh, uh, different gods and temples. Uh, somebody, some, somebody makes a quote that there was essentially a, a temple on every street corner uh, to one god or another. Uh, the next thing we notice is that the, uh, the lion was made to stand upon his feet like a man. And this, this represents an outward change and something that was visible, visibly different about the Babylonian than the Assyrian. Um, and, it, and it has to do with the, the idea of being man-like. It's a, it's a progression. Uh, the Assyrian was very aggressive, uh, dominating, uh, you know, dangerous, destructive like a lion. And in the, in the Babylonian, we see a, a change coming. We see a, a change being made. No longer uh, it, caring about expansion, but also now having this outward look of like a man. Uh, and we, we related that this likeness to the idea in Genesis and the creation of man was in the likeness of the Elohim. Okay. <coughs> so there was, a, there was a, a, a visible outward change in the Babylonian Empire from the Assyrian. And then the last thing in verse 4 is given a man's heart. And this was an inward change. And uh, this, this indicates the, the change of attitude in Nebuchadnezzar. And we know from the story, don't we, um, that Nebuchadnezzar goes from uh, uh, an individual who was intent on on uh, converting his new captives to Babylonian ways and the Babylonian gods and the Babylonian sciences. And uh, he ends up believing in the God of Israel, doesn't he? The way that God works with him, worked with him through uh, the fiery furnace, right? The things which he witnessed there. And then, of course, the, the time that he spent like a wild beast with his hair growing and his fingernails growing like claws and such until the time where he, be, where he uh, came to understand that indeed the kingdom of men belongs to Yahweh and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. Uh, so this is, in, this is what is the, the change of heart. The, uh, the Babylonian uh, emperor was far more susceptible, if you will, to divine understanding than his Assyrian counterpart. Uh, the Assyrian kings were uh, true beasts um, and having, having no inclination. And we see that, in, if you remember when Rabshakeh came against the walls of, of uh, Jerusalem, right? And he saw absolutely no difference between the God of Israel and the gods of the other nations whom he had already subdued. And he had he had no no uh, no respect for Yahweh. He saw absolutely no difference, and that was the that was the Assyrian mindset. Keeping in mind that their chief deity was a was a god of war, and the king was the was that deity's representative on earth. Um, Babylonian a little bit different. They wanted to convert you, um, and that whole that whole attitude is something that is. Um, uh, is common in our days, isn't it? The the it actually became 
um, somewhat popularized by the by the Greeks, the idea of um, changing people gradually through indoctrination. Um, but that's that's the that's the challenge that we face in this day and age. Humanism is very subtle, and it and it affects so many aspects of our daily life. Uh, that sometimes we become numb to it. We don't even realize that our minds are being changed by this world. And we need to, of course, we need to you know, make sure that we, we spend our time here and our focus is on the Word. And this is what's going to make the, that other philosophy stand out in our minds and, and so that we understand that this is right and true and that is a danger to our spiritual lives. Um, but the, the Babylonian was very much that way. Um, the idea was to was to change you so that you thought like they thought. Okay. All right. So now that brings us to the bear, which of course we understand the bear face to be representative of the Medes and the Persians. And there was we noted last time there was an aspect of bear's fighting technique that explains the choice of this creature for the Persian Empire. Now, the Assyrian was ruthless and swift like a winged lion. The, the Babylonian was, was essentially dis, disinterested in conquest. Um, but what about the bear? I found a quote in the 1940 Christadelphia magazine, and the writer, they, and if you're familiar with the old magazines, they just put the three initials of the brother who wrote it, so you really don't know who wrote it. I, I couldn't figure it out anyway. Um, but he said, the bear exactly described the heavy aggressiveness, aggressiveness of Medo-Persia, who put hordes of men into the battlefield and slowly crushed their victims by sheer force of numbers. Their methods were prompted by greed and spoil, devouring much flesh. Of necessity, they moved ponderously as a bear because of the size of the army. And then I had a quote last time um, from... A, a website that I found on Iranian military history. And why would Iranian military history be be significant? Because Persia was Iran. Modern Iran is is the land of Persia, right? So they're talking about their history and commenting on uh, Persia's battle with the Scythians in 512. Now the Scythians were the were the uh, the um, tribal peoples from the north, like Germany, Russia, that area, okay? And they came down, if you know your history, uh, they came, the Scythians came down and actually uh, attacked the Assyrian Empire to the point where it was weakened, where Babylon and the Medes together could, could overcome the Assyrians. And that's how the Assyrian Empire was defeated. It was, they, the Scythians spent 10 years picking away at the Assyrian power uh, until such a time that the Assyrian was weakened and the Babylonian was able to overcome. So uh, again, um, commenting on a, on a battle that the Persians had with the Scythians, the Persian strategy was so conceived as to require the use of an almost unlimited number of men and resources. By a gigantic effort, Darius succeeded in bringing his army across Asia into Europe crossing first the Bosphorus, so he's crossing Turkey into Greece in the area of Istanbul, and then crossing the Danube, which is north of the Bosphorus, with a force of about 720,000 men uh, supported by the entire strength of the Persian Navy. So that's quite a force, 720,000 men. It's almost a Three quarters of a million. The, uh, the observation that that brother made in 1940 was, was backed up by that quote from the Iranian military history that I found. So this was the, the, the bear's method, method of conquest. Um, being raised up on one side, of course, Brother Thomas associates this with the exchange of sovereignty from the Mede first to the Persian later. Um, I have a quote from Fawcett's Bible Dictionary concerning Darius the Mede. This Darius received the kingdom. Daniel 5, verse 31, of Babylon as viceroy. Okay, we talk about that. A viceroy is someone who is appointed to rule a country in the deputy of the sovereign. So he wasn't really the king. He was the one that the king placed in on the throne to rule for him. That's what 
Darius the Mede was. So who was the true authority? Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus the Persian was the, the, the true conqueror. And he put uh, Darius, who was some, some sort of relation, I forget exactly, um, on the throne. Okay, so he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. He didn't, he didn't, Darius himself did not um, secure the victory, but rather he was placed as a viceroy. Uh, the reason being is that the bear was not done in its conquest. It still had other conquests to do. Um, but the way scripture's testimony is written, there must have been more to the relationship between the Medes and the Persians. It's interesting to note that a phrase that is used in, both in Daniel and Esther, but slightly different. Because in Daniel, at, um, in Daniel chapter 6, reference is made according to the law of the Medes and the Persians. But we, we read in Esther 1, among the laws of the Persians and Medes. So it indicates that there was a change there. Um, the primary authority is reversed, showing the change of prominence in, in the two kingdoms. Um, and that's, it's not really well graphically just, you know, shown in that picture, but you can see that one side of the bears is higher than the other. And that's indicating the, uh, the dominance of the Persian over the Mede. Uh, the Mede, the Mede was, uh, society eventually was swallowed up by the Persians. All right, three ribs in the mouth. We're going to talk about this really, really quick. Um, so they were, they were uh, Brother Mansfield gives a satisfactory explanation, uh, and he equates the three ribs to three uh, kingdoms that the Persians conquered. Uh, first was Lydia, um, and I think I have, yep, okay. Lydia, then Egypt, then Babylon. Okay. Um, and Lydia was noted for its wealth. Lydia was, at that time, <coughs> was the western half of what is now Turkey. So if you can imagine, you know, north of Israel and the, how Turkey juts out, well, that western half of that was Lydia. Um, Egypt was noted for its antiquity and culture, and then, of course, Babylon noted for its strength. So if Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon had united together, they would have been able to beat Cyrus, um, but he picked them off one by one, and that's the explanation of the three ribs. All right, so now we want to get to the, the main topic for today, and that is the leopard phase, um, which we see in verse 6. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given unto it. So in regards to the leopard, Harp, Harper's Bible Dictionary says, a large cat with characteristic spots. Well, that's pretty generic, right? The leopard is at home in mountainous terrain, especially Mount Hermon and Lebanon. A few leopards are still to be found in Israel and Jordan. Habakkuk 1 verse 8 mentions horses that are swifter than the leopard, but this probably refers instead to the cheetah another large cat once present in the area which was trained for use in hunting. And I thought that was significant because the, the cheetah was a, uh, is a relative to a leopard, okay? Um, but as we will see, the word that's used there actually refers to any number of large cat-like creatures. Um, but the cheetah was specifically used for hunting. So again, we get this idea of, of uh, aggression. New Bible Dictionary. In popular usage, the word leopard, usually with a qualifying word, stands for a number of different spotted cats. It's possible that the Hebrew namir refers to both the true leopard and the cheetah, or the hunting leopard, and also to one or two other spotted wild cats of Palestine. Well, the... the in, in any case, the predominant trait that distinguishes this animal is its speed. And the choice of this speedy creature uh, representing Greece, it, this illustrates the swiftness of the conquests of Alexander. 
So I've got a quote here from the Ancient History Encyclopedia concerning Alexander's conquests. I'm going to bring a map up and we can, we can look at it and just go through and imagine, I want you to look at the, the extent of his empire and the swiftness of his conquest. So Alexander's military prowess was first noted at the Battle of Heronia, which was in Greece, in 338 B.C. Okay, so here we are, 338 B.C., now, Alexander's only 18 years old at this point, and he helped turn the tide of the battle, um, defeating a few southern uh, Greek city-states who were allied against his father. His father was Philip II, and Philip II was instrumental at, in organizing all, the, all of the states of the Greeks into one, okay? And... Alexander began his military career at the, year, at the age of 18, helping dad out to consolidate the Greeks. Well, the Greeks were, uh, Philip was organizing the Greeks at, in an effort to uh, stave off the Persians. Okay, so this is what, this is what uh, Philip was trying to do. But uh, Philip was assassinated two years later in 336 B.C. So 336 B.C., Alexander assumes the throne, and now having the Greek states unified under him in the Macedonian rule, he embarks upon his father's great conquest, conquest of the, uh, of the Persian Empire. Okay, so with an army of, of 32,000, now remember, remember how... How many the, the uh, Persians had? 720,000 men. So Alexander's got 32,000 with him. And he had 5,000 cavalry. He crosses over to Asia Minor in 334 BC. So this is only four years after his, his uh, first notable uh, battle. Uh, in, in, in essence, only two years after he assumed the throne. So he sacked the city of Baalbek and renamed it Heliopolis. 333 BC, uh, Alexander and his troops defeated the larger force of Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Isos. In 332 BC, he conquered Syria. Okay. That's, that's one year later. So it's basically six years after he began his military campaign. And then in 331, he conquered Egypt. So this is seven years after he began. Alexander met King Darius III in the battlefield at Guagamala, <laughs> where again, facing overwhelming numbers, he decisively defeated, de defeated Darius, who fled the field. Alexander proclaimed himself king of Asia and continued on to march to the great city of Susa. And we're familiar with Susa from scripture, right? Shushan. All right. So that is the capital of Persia there. Um, and Susa surrendered unconditionally without resistance. 329 BC, which is nine years since he started, he founded the city of Alexandria Escat on the, oh, this is another tough one. <laughs> I'm going to call it Izartes River, um, which is up here. He destroyed the city of Syropolis and defeated, ah, the Scythians. We're familiar with the Scythians. Alexander founded many cities bearing his name during this time to further his public image as a god and adopted the title Shahan Shah, King of Kings, used by the rulers of the first Persian Empire. In keeping with this status, Alexander introduced the, the Persian kingdom to pro oh, I can't even say these words. There's a custom where uh, when his soldiers came to him, they had to kneel before him. Okay, so so he, he introduced to the, to the uh, Greek culture this idea of uh, they, they kneel before him and they kiss his hand, okay, before they address him. In battles throughout 320, 
7 BC and into 326 BC, Alexander subdued the Western tribes of India. Okay. And Alexander intended to march on across the river Ganges to a further conquest, but his troops, worn out by hard-fought battles, mutiny and refused to go further. Alexander tried to persuade his men to press on, but failing to win them over, finally gave in. He died in Babylon at the age of 32 on the 11th June, 323 BC, 15 years after suffering, 15, 15 years since his, his most notable battle, after suffering 10 days of high fever. Theories concerning his cause of death have ranged from poisoning to malaria to meningitis to bacterial infection from drinking contaminated water and others. Plutarch, and this is a, uh, a Greek historian of the first century, says that 14 days before his death, Alexander entertained his fleet admiral Nearchus and his friend Medius with long bouts of drinking, after which he fell into a fever from which he never recovered. When he was asked who should succeed him, Alexander simply said, the strongest, which answer led to his empire being divided between four of his generals, Cassander, Ptolemy, Antigonus, and Seleucus. Okay, so from his first attack on the Persian Empire until his death was a mere 11 years. And you remember how large that empire was. It stretched from Greece in the west to India in the east, from the Scythian tribal areas in the north to Egypt in the south. Eleven years. Hence the leopard with wings. Okay, and wings again, the conquest. Why four wings? Because he had four generals, okay, who were instrumental in his conquest. Okay, I'm going to skip that, and we're going to talk about the four heads. Um, and we see that in, in verse 6. Four, it, the beast had four heads, and within the context of the heads, the word dominion, it, we find that word dominion in the context. The, four, the beast had four heads, and dominion was given unto it. So this is a symbolic division of the Greek Empire following Alexander's death. Um, obviously, the, the Greek Empire did not end with Alexander's death. He was that, that one, he was one head representing the ruling entity. So that was divided into four. And this is outlined in Daniel 8, verse 8. Therefore, the he-goat, which is the Greek Empire, waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn, that's Alexander, was broken, and for it came up four notable ones towards the four winds of heaven. So Alexander was the notable uh, horn of the Grecian goat, which had overcome the Persian ram. And when that horn was broken, Scripture tells us four other horns rose up to take its place. And Brother Thomas outlines these horns, and the, uh, which are um, uh, paralleled by the heads in Daniel chapter 7 as follows. Okay, the first head, the kingdom of the south, comprehending Egypt, Libya, Arabia, and southern Palestine under the uh, Ptolemies. Okay, so that gentleman right there is one of uh, Alexander's uh, four generals named Ptolemy. The second head, uh, the kingdom of the northwest, including Thrace, Bithynia, this was the Thraco uh, Macedonian, and this was given to Antigonus. Okay, now we're not so familiar with Antigonus. I hope we're familiar with Ptolemy. Okay, at least a little bit, maybe. No? All right. Um, the third head, Kingdom of the Northeast, and this is a large area, comprehending the rest of Asia, inclusive of Babylon and its province, extending beyond the Euphrates to the Indus, right? So we're talking from, from Babylon, which you see just south of that, of that face, all the way over to India. Um, and this was the Macedo-Babylonish kingdom of the Seleucidae. 
So this was Seleucus, Seleucus, and we should be familiar. Ptolemy and Seleucus, we should be familiar with. Finally, the fourth head, he must not have been very popular because I, I couldn't find any pictures of uh, any statues of him, only on a coin. Uh, in the kingdom of the West, Macedonia and Greece, and this was given to Cassander. Okay. So, two of them were significant in Scripture, Ptolemy and Seleucia. And if you're familiar with Daniel chapter 2, the belly of brass representing Alexander was divided into two legs. And yet we see a, a four-way division of the Greek Empire. And that's because only Ptolemy in the south and Seleucia in the, in the north made a bit of difference um, in regards to Scripture. Now, historically, these, these other men were, were significant. But in regards to Scripture, only the one in the south and the one in the north were important because they battled over Judea. Okay, so in the time previous to the Roman Empire, Ptolemy and Seleucia, where they were fighting back and forth, king of the south, king of the north, kind of a deal. Okay, so the, when when Daniel's image is, divides the the uh, Greek Empire, it gives us only two legs, because scripturally speaking, there's only two significant uh, divisions of that empire. So contributions of the Greek Empire to the kingdom of men. And this has bearing on the development from the Roman, of the Roman, out of the Greek. Um, and that's, of course, in the fourth beast, which we're not even going to touch today. Um, I have a quote here from the ancient historical encyclopedia again. And, and this speaks to the idea that I was trying to express before about the way in which the Greeks uh, influenced other peoples and languages under their, under their authority. Aristotle's influence directly bore upon Alexander's later dealings with the people he conquered, in that Alexander never forced the culture of Greece upon the inhabitants of the various regions, but merely introduced it in the same way that Aristotle used to teach his students. So he didn't force it, he introduced it. He introduced Greek culture. And as we know, Greek culture lives on till today, doesn't it? There's much of... Uh, modern philosophy that we see in our world. Anybody know what's one of probably the most, the biggest Greek influence in our, in our society here in the United States? Huh? Oh, democracy. That was a Greek idea. <laughs> okay, so Greece still lives on. And we know that, that all of these cultures live on, don't we? Because when the image stands to be destroyed by the stone that is cut without the mountain without hands, the whole image is standing complete. And it isn't just the feet that are destroyed in the time of Christ. It's the whole image together as ground becomes like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and is blown away. Right? So these, these cultures continue to live on. Babylon, we know, lives on and, and uh, the church is around us. Right? Okay. Um, another ancient world history website, Hellenization was the spread of Greek culture and the assimilation into Greek culture of non-Greek peoples. It was a notable trait of ancient Greek civilization, an approach to other cultures that was not merely invasive or dominant, but transformative. When they came to inhabit the isles and mainland of what is now Greece, they displaced the indigenous Pel Pelasgians, never heard of them, bringing with them some form of their writing, language, religion, and art. The native culture was soon absorbed into that of the new arrival. Though Her Herodotus, we've talked about him before, attests some Pelasgian groups surviving with mutually intelligible language, most intermarried and became fully Greek, invisible, and largely forgotten. Does that ring a bell? How the, how the uh, um, one culture is absorbed into another through marriage. We all remember Noah, right? In, in chapter 6, sons of God saw the daughters of men, right? That was the, that was the method 
that was breaking down the ecclesia of Seth in that time. And this is this was the philosophy of the Greeks. And of course, the Greeks were great thinkers. Right? They were all about the gray matter between the ears. So their conquest was a conquest of the mind. And in this case, they intermarried, and that culture, that previous culture, was lost. The most important period of Hellenization by far was that which transpired under the reign of Alexander the Great. He integrated his army, allowing non-Greek, non-Macedonian troops in the same units as natives, and strongly encouraging intermarriage with foreign women to blur the barriers between the conquering and the conquered peoples. Even Roman-controlled areas became more and more Hellenized. Greek was the language of trade and culture, the common tongue necessary for travelers. Palestine became strongly Hellenized to the extent that Greek forms the names displaced of the Semitic originals, with Yeshua becoming Jesus, for instance. More and more Jewish leaders feared that their people would lose their identity. Greek philosophy was a major contributor in the insidious philosophy of our age, humanism. Um, I have a quote from a, a website, philosophybasics.com, philosophy. Okay, so this has a definite Greece, Grecian uh, leanings. In ancient Greece, Thales, who was credited with creating the maxim, know thyself, in the 6th century BC, is sometimes considered a proto-humanist. Xenophanes of Colophon, <laughs> very colorful names, uh, who lived from 570 to 480 BC, Anaxagoras, Pericles, uh, Protagoras, Democritus, Democritus Demo uh, Democracy, and the historian, this other guy, were all instrumental in the move away from a spiritual morality based on the supernatural and the development of free thought, the view that beliefs should be formed on the basis of science and logic and not to be influenced by emotion, authority, tradition, or dogma. So these, these men that I struggled with their names, they were instrumental uh, through Greek influence of turning men's minds away from the supernatural, away from religion, into free thought, based on the sciences and the philosophies of the day. And if that isn't humanism, I don't know what is. Okay. So these, this, uh, the influence of the, of the Greek Empire uh, introduced this, uh, a, a measure of free thought, uh, democracy, which is which became the um, the battle cry, if you will, of much of the revolution, uh, which formed Europe into what it is today. Uh, this is largely through G Greek influence. So, as we're considering these uh, empires of the past, um, and Lord willing, sometime we'll look at that fourth. Fourth beast, which may take a couple weeks in and of itself because it is a large subject. Um, what we need to remember as Christadelphians is that the, these, the influences of these empires are still there. They, are, they, they have effect upon us. And the insidious nature of their tactics breaks down our resistance uh, through a constant exposure to these philosophies and ideas to the point eventually where we stand in danger of being absorbed into the world and losing our identification as being the people of God. So as we understand it, as shown in uh, Daniel chapter 2, and as we go through Daniel chapter 7, that's the same idea is being brought out, is that this kingdom of men stands uh, politically and philosophically opposed to the kingdom of God. And the fourth beast in its development, as we will see someday, um, actually is the, that development is brought out most completely in the apocalypse. 
because that the the apocalypse is the uh, the history, if you will, of the development of that religious system, which stands contrary to the kingdom of God. So in Daniel, we see a political and philosophical uh, kingdom being developed in in contrast or in conflict. I think is a better word with the kingdom of God. And of course, the kingdom of God will overcome and will destroy the kingdom of men. And but in the apocalypse, we see it. We see a different aspect of man's rebellion against God through the development of that fourth beast system and the manner in which that system continues on in our day, it is very much a religious conflict. And that, as we know, we read through the apocalypse, that conflict also, Yahweh will be victorious and the smoke of Rome's burning will go up forever and ever. But we haven't gotten to that fourth beast yet. And we may not for a while, but (laughs) we'll see.